corpse was found near the rubbish dump. I don't know why they killed him. Apartheid era South Africa. More people are dying every day. I asked the man, who is this person you have buried in my son's grave? When we go to court, they try to scare us away. Bloodshed was only one weapon used to force racial separation here for nearly 300 years. Blacks and whites fought back with nonviolent protests and attempts to talk peace. But the violence continued until no black family was untouched. And the once cautious voices of some leaders, like Nelson Mandela, turned strident. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Inspired by Mandela, then a spokesman for the African National Congress, or ANC, freedom fighters took up arms, bombing unpopulated targets. The apartheid government responded by stepping up the repression of innocent people, outlawing the ANC, and rounding up its leaders. Mandela received a life sentence and was sent to Robben Island Prison. Only five miles off the coast of Cape Town, the prison at Robben Island is surrounded by cold, strong currents, making it one of the most secure in the world. Inmates there were considered enemies of the state and were treated accordingly. Separated from the mainland, beaten, starved, and tortured physically and psychologically. Despite this, it was here that Mandela and fellow inmates planned for South Africa after apartheid. A peaceful, egalitarian society based on reconciliation between the races. Reconciliation between centuries-old enemies. Thirty years later, the country celebrates its first black president. Apartheid laws have been abolished. The people have made Mandela an icon, signifying the respect they accord him and their hope in his dream. Laat ons de verleden vergeet. Wat voorbij is, is voorbij. Let us forget the past. Let us now work together to make this country a great country. And if you give us your support, there is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that we have a country that is going to play its role throughout the continent and indeed throughout the world. It's a new South Africa. The end of apartheid has meant dramatic increases in the opportunities for blacks. For the first time in 300 years, the rapidly growing black middle and upper middle classes are free to socialize, work, and live wherever their money can take them. Life for many of them is sweet. On the surface, the scenes on the streets of larger cities like Johannesburg seem to personify racial harmony.
The same is true in Cape Town, where races mingle in ways previously considered illegal and unthinkable. Just offshore, Robben Island Prison, once the symbol of the violent and oppressive hand of apartheid, has become a burgeoning tourist attraction. It's as if some here have forgotten the past. Okay, this was Nelson Mandela's cell. But for others, forgetting is not possible. <laughs> It is a weekday morning in Sebokeng, about 25 miles south of Johannesburg. The township is home to nearly 200,000 people, none of them white. <laughs> 43-year-old Sidiso Pofu is heading to a nearby church, not to worship, but to try and stop the nightmares, memories of his years in Robben Island prison, and the price he paid for fighting the apartheid government. Memories that, some 20 years later, will not go away. And they will keep you naked, tie your legs from behind. They'll use electric shock on your testicles. They are putting a sack on your head. They pour cold water on the sack, and they start again. Today, Sidiso seeks strength from the Kulamani group. These survivors of apartheid violence come together to support each other and speak of their own personal nightmares. The new South Africa requires that races reconcile and asks people like these many of whom still reside in the depths of poverty, to live peacefully with those they hold responsible for their misery. A step made more difficult by the magnitude of their personal losses. <laughs> Children and husbands missing and murdered, their killers left unpunished, their families left destitute. One of our brothers, our fathers, now the only thing I'm left with is a box. I don't know what to do because I'm still young. I saw corpses when I was still young. I would like you to show me how to find peace in my heart. The people with the least were asked to forgive the most. I, won't be, I don't want to behave like Comrade President Nelson Mandela, who will embrace his torturers. I won't be like him. I'm very sorry I cannot do that. The key question to a peaceful future for South Africa is whether blacks can forgive the heinous crimes of the past. There were debates around this question. I never thought I'd shake the hand of a man who has tortured him with electric wires and things. I did. I'll tell you why. Hatred consumes the one in whom it is being generated. Tokyo Sewale, jailed during apartheid for sabotage, was part of Mandela's inner circle. Even then, they knew that reconciliation would not come easy. In the struggle, we lost my own brother. So, so, so this is not something far-fetched. It hits right home here. This man was killed by the police. Two shots on the head, that's what we found with the skull. We didn't know where he was. They buried him secretly. Unmarked shallow grave on a farm and they shut up for 14 years. I was in jail when this happened. Tokyo was imprisoned on the notorious Robben Island. The prison is located at the tip of the African continent, on one of the world's most beautiful islands. It is a place that has seen a parade of human inhabitants, outcasts, including the sick, the mad, and the rebellious. The Dutch were the first to imprison insurgent black Africans on Robben Island. 
The British continued the tradition until superstitions about leprosy and mental illness convinced them to make it a sanatorium for lunatics, the chronically ill poor, and lepers. The island still bears the scars. Prisoners never saw the beautiful side of the island. Their memories of it are much different. When the apartheid government opened the maximum security prison in 1960, they built a special block of 30 single cells, Section B, for high-profile political prisoners, including Nelson Mandela and Tokyo Sewale. Tokyo spent 14 years imprisoned behind walls like this one. You must never see that wall, because the wall is there to frustrate and to break and to kill you and to take you away from family, friends and everything. Eh? You call that the hardest? The wall is there to make sure that you have no movement. Prison is about denial of movement, the space is limited. Individual cells were tiny and had no running water. Guards monitored the prisoners every movement and sometimes worked to make each day as miserable as possible. We're all black, they're all white. Their training is to break us down, to humiliate us, to do all types of inhuman things. Hundreds of other prisoners were crammed into large communal cells with political prisoners and hardcore criminals confined together. Before 64, the majority of prisoners were criminals. They were vile because they did the dirty work, you know, of the warders in bashing up, you know, and abusing political prisoners. Lionel Davis, sentenced to seven years for treason, remembers the lime quarry, where guards conspired with criminal prisoners to harass them. The political prisoners had to push full wheelbarrows of stones. Criminal prisoners, big gangsters, were also here at that time. They followed with empty wheelbarrows, knocking their heels from the back if they moved too slow. The lime quarry intensified the effects of the sun. To keep spirits up and to avoid passing out, prisoners sang. Singing rhythmically helped us to break down the hardness of the work made it more tolerable. The lime was getting into your eyes, into your ears, burning. Intolerable heat that you had to endure. The stone-cold walls of Robben Island were the prisoner's entire world, the mainland of distant memory. Periodically, prisoners fought back with hunger strikes, work slowdowns, and a simple refusal to smile for the camera. But their dream of freedom held firm. Well, the men who were in Robben Island were sure that one day will come back. And, uh, but of course, there were moments when uh, it appeared that uh, the apartheid regime had uh, almost destroyed a resistance. There were those moments. On the mainland, those moments may have seemed to last forever. In the three centuries of forced racial segregation, black South Africans created a world of their own, where the sense of community was strong. Although everyone in black communities suffered oppression, it was the youth who began to fight back. Black people are long-tempered people. It's very uh, difficult for them to be angry within a minute. Their, their anger is always accumulated. That is why when you, 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 you can uh, take into the events that led to the 76 upheavals, you'll find that this is not the thing which started in 76. 
It has been a process from 1953 when the Bantu Education Act was established. The 1953 Bantu Education Act was a cornerstone of apartheid with a sinister intention. The purpose of Bantu education is to ensure that the natives will be taught from childhood that equality with Europeans is not for them. Soweto, June 1976. The children of South Africa take over the streets, protesting forced instruction in Afrikaans. For them, the language of oppression. Avril Brandt was then a high school student in Cape Town. Her attitude about the uprising was typical of many white South Africans. What I can remember about 1976 is I couldn't understand why these children, why these black and colored children are burning down their schools. You know, that, that was totally beyond my understanding at that time. And of course, nobody told us. <laughs> Within a year, 600 students were dead, shot down by police. The government considered each demonstration the students staged, each rock they threw, each class they missed, a crime against the state. Yet each action struck a chord for freedom and a death knell for apartheid. White people were led to believe that the black people were communists and devils and terrorists. The indoctrination, you know, black people are stupid. Uh, how can they ever run a country? That kind of thing. So you were absolutely anti-patriotic if you believed otherwise. Entrenched beliefs about their inferiority made protesters even more defiant. Thousands were arrested including one of their student leaders, Sidiso Pofu. I never regarded myself as a terrorist. I regarded myself as a freedom fighter. And I thought I was a peace-loving person because I didn't take any arms. I was just talking. But it was a surprise that today I'm called a terrorist. My sole aim was to liberate the black people. No one in his family could believe it of Sidiso. Growing up in Sabokang with his parents, sisters, and brother, he'd always been the quiet one, the intellectual, the political idealist, the dreamer. Sidiso risked capture, torture, and even death for the cause. He was eventually arrested, detained by police near Sabokang, and tortured around the clock for six months. During the night, they will open a window and hold you with your legs, laying, looking downwards. And they'll tell you that if you don't tell the truth, we can leave you here and you'll drop down. And when you are dead, we'll just tell the people whom you are leading that we are trying to commit suicide. You are trying to run away. Sidiso never betrayed his comrades. He was convicted of sedition and sent to Robben Island. Once there, he and other prisoners were cut off from the movement and their families. In a forgotten corner of Robben Island prison, a Discovery Channel camera crew found these remnants of the loneliness prisoners suffered. Boxes of letters and photographs from loved ones censored by the guards and never received by the prisoners. The, the brutality in prison was psychological. People were no longer being tortured in, in jail, being killed inside. But there was a new way of, of, of dealing with, with prisoners. Oppress them, break their minds, that type of thing. These broken telephones were once the only link between inmates in the outside world. Once every six months, for 30 minutes, the lucky ones looked through glass partitions into the faces of friends or relatives and spoke of home. You know if you've got a visit from your mother, and your mother has come to tell you that your brother is dead, 
and it's two minutes before the end of that 30 minutes. And your mother says, I've got bad news before I go. I just wanted to see how strong you are. Your brother is dead. And you said, what? She says, <clears throat> she sobs. And she says, your brother died. This man says, time up. It was harsh, but the Robben Island, Sidiso, and Tokyo entered was changing for the better. International pressure forced officials to allow some inmates to take correspondence courses. It was a privilege denied at the guard's whim to inhabitants of certain cells. And those cells were often raided in the middle of the night. They'd stand against the wall, they searched the blanket, confiscated whatever was regarded as illegal, and they would punish whoever was guilty. If the guilty one wasn't found, they would punish the old cell. But it did not stop people from educating themselves. A few of the prisoners in Mandela's cell block were, like him, highly educated. They created a kind of makeshift university to educate and groom other inmates. I think this was the primary motivation that one day we will govern. And there was rank speculation, you know, as to who would be the prime minister, who was going to have the portfolio of, you know, uh, commerce and finance. At most, the relationships between guards and prisoners were difficult. Most warders were from poor working class Afrikaner families, some even less educated than the prisoners they were guarding. So they would make it a point, you know, especially if you were a lawyer, a doctor, you know, a teacher, to humiliate you, to show how powerful they were. But what also, on the other hand, influenced them in a very positive way is that they saw a study. Despite the disapproval of some of his peers, Mandela actually developed close relationships with some guards. They were friendships that helped soothe racial tension. One such guard was Christo Brandt. And I didn't know who was Mandela. I never knew about I politics, knew about politics. even in school. Even in school, I never heard of Mandela until the day I landed here on Robben Island. They took me to him and said that he was one of the worst, most criminal people I would work with on Robben Island. And he tried always. But there were lots of times he really helped me as a friend. He always encouraged me to learn, to study further. He was always like, like a father to me. The barracks where Christo and other officials lived on Robben Island was a world away from the prison cells. An all Afrikaner settlement where apartheid was God's will. The first time I settled on Robben Island, I fell in love with it. So it's as if I came home, but there's something here that makes me feel I belong here. Typical little village, typical small town mentality, but also very fond of one another, as long as you stayed within the boundaries. Everything was regulated and very strict social control. Avril has lived on Robben Island for nearly a decade as the wife of prison employee Gerhard Brandt. Life here was a continuation of working class Africana culture on the mainland where they'd grown up. You know, there were certain things which children simply did not speak about. And growing up in an Afrikaans household, you never questioned your parents. You accepted. Gerhardt was first a guard, then a warden at Robben Island Prison. Like other South Africans, he accepted that the best of his country was reserved for whites. For many of them, it was a charmed life. At the government's whim, any area could be declared off limits to black South Africans. Some wealthy white neighborhoods, surrounded by walls, were totally forbidden 
unless blacks were servants in someone's home. Then they were necessary, taken for granted and invisible. Outside the cloistered walls of white communities, black protests intensified during the early 1980s. So too did police brutality. Statistics collected by human rights organizations show that at least 51,000 protesters were arrested and tortured without trial. 50,000 were hauled into court for a variety of anti-apartheid activities. More than 5,000 people were killed in township clashes with police, and well over 100 political leaders were assassinated by government-sanctioned hit squads. But white citizens here were kept in the dark. The government-controlled media made sure they did not get the full story. And the first time I really started questioning, deeply questioning the whole system was when I went overseas. Because for the first time I was allowed to freely associate. And I came into contact with people who are strongly critical about South Africa. It was not until Avril visited her sister in Europe that she saw and heard how the world viewed the way blacks were treated in her country. The first thing that happens is you go into a state of denial. It's not happening in my country. My people do not do things like that. And then you start to see things on overseas television. You are coming to contact with people who are perhaps exiled, and you start discussing things that, that you almost felt embarrassed to say you are South African. When Avril returned, she told me about this international group that she joined in there and she showed me photos and to me it was upsetting to see a guy from Chile sitting with his arm around Avril at a dinner and see her standing speaking to a person from Ghana, a black man, and I didn't know what happened to her. The whole country was poised for change. By the late 1980s, international sanctions and internal pressure forced South Africa's economy to the brink of collapse. Activists and labor unions joined ranks, voicing a united demand to end apartheid. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the single most unifying voice of the time. Continue in the struggle to make South Africa free. From the streets to the pulpit, the Anglican bishop denounced the government to the world. At the height of repression, he called for the dismantling of apartheid the unbanning of the African National Congress and the release of all political prisoners. Cape Town, February 11, 1990. The world stopped to watch one man take a few slow steps to freedom. Mandela's release was a victory over apartheid and the brutal symbolism of Robben Island. We rose, we rose, we fought back. Therefore, Robben Island, the final thing that it represents is victory. We won, hands down. It is how to maintain that victory that becomes the challenge for the future. Change came in successive ways after Mandela's release. Apartheid laws were being dismantled. All political prisoners were freed. Things happened fast. Robben Island, February 24, 1995. Dawn, in the distance, the outline of the Cape Town coast. Near the harbor, at the same time each morning, a small group of penguins make their way across the street, heading for the cove. As the day matures, 1,000 former prisoners return as free men. This first reunion brought together comrades who thought they'd never see each other again. It was quite an experience. You know, when you enter this path to Roman Island, 
there is that emotional feelings because it always symbolizes your past. <laughs> Caught up in the emotion of the day, many ex-prisoners took souvenirs from the sea, an activity not allowed them as inmates. Mandela came to the island this time, surrounded by media, dignitaries, and other ex-prisoners. The man who gave 27 years of his life for South Africa's freedom was now its president, an icon of the 20th century. To the world, a symbol of peace and reconciliation between the races. He stuck right note at the right historical moment. And he didn't waste time. He never failed. He kept those who were remaining behind in the leash and, and, and held back those who were running too far ahead. Mandela is well loved and respected by people of all races as a man who devoted his life to the healing of his country. We have succeeded because whatever problems we have, Everybody can see that we have achieved something which is hailed by the world as a miracle. Yet even his most ardent supporters admit that his policy of racial reconciliation may foster a false sense of complacency among some South Africans. There is a kind of other entitlement, culture of entitlement amongst whites that uh, they look at uh, President Mandela and other people and, 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 and they see this willingness to forgive and they don't say, hey, aren't we lucky? Aren't we just blessed that we've got people like him and others around? And that basically for, for, for us white people not a great deal has changed. I mean, we might have lost uh, political power, but we still live in clover. I mean, it's the blacks who, who live in the shacks. To save my mother's life, must I become a criminal? I have talked to the town council, but they do not take up my complaint. David Ntombeni's brother was killed while attending an apartheid-era wake. That day, more than 40 people were shot down by government-sponsored gunmen. David sees others who now have more than he does and wonders if their freedom was more costly than his. I would like to ask Bishop Tutu, Bishop Tutu, as you have buried our children, what do you have to say about them? Because it is you who buried them. But at the end of the day, we still do not know where and how they died. Desmond Tutu conducted funeral services for many of those who died in apartheid violence. Few people know better the scale of personal loss experienced in this country and the magnitude of expectations leveled at Mandela and his government. We can't do everything. Uh, we try a little bit, but I think that we've got to be building up alliances, coalitions in the church and faith communities of people who will stand side by side with those who have gone through these horrendous experiences. Tutu heads the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC established as part of the nation's new constitution. The government set up the TRC to help victims rehabilitate their lives, give them audience, and encourage perpetrators to publicly confess their wrongs. The commission accepts applications for amnesty from those who want to talk. Some of them already convicted and in prison, 
Others apply to tell their stories in hopes of escaping punishment. One such application came from former security police captain Dirk Kutsia. He came forward to fully detail atrocities committed under orders. Drops were administered to, to Siswe Kondile in a drink whilst we were sitting around drinking ourselves. The two junior officers brought dense bushveld hood with tires and whilst he was lying, Mr. Kondile was lying on his back, shot him on top of the head. There was a short jerk and that was it. The four junior uh, non-commissioned officers each grabbed a hand and a foot, put it onto the pyre of tire and wood, poured petrol on it and set it alight. Mandela's miracle, Tutu says, is that some people forgive despite the horrors committed against them and their loved ones in the name of apartheid. What would you do if you sat in an amnesty hearing and someone was saying of your son, we shot him behind the ear and then we burned his body. And whilst his body was burning on the side, we were having a barbecue. And the chunks of meat, especially the, 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 the buttocks and the upper parts of the legs had to be turned frequently during the night. What would you say? I mean, wouldn't you, as a normal mother, say, I'm not ready to forgive people who could commit such horrendous atrocities? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission decides who receives amnesty. No one who appears here has to say they are sorry. My name is Nontlantla. I live in Zone 7. I lost my child in 1991. They are just wasting our time saying we must forgive our children's killers. How can we forgive people who are not sorry? It is people like these, from Sebokang's Kulomani group, who come most often before the commission as victims or survivors. Because they are invited to tell their stories of loss, many mistakenly expect the commission to act for them. I have my grandson who is 10 years old. His mother was killed. He is mentally disturbed and has always failed at school. I would like the TRC to help me with his future. I have been to doctors everywhere. I went to the TRC for the future of this child. And people can say, but I mean, you said you were victim friendly. How come you have done nothing for us? And, and I would say it is justifiable and we've been to uh, the government and told them, I mean, this is an intolerable situation. Although Parliament is currently debating a plan to compensate victims and survivors for their losses, lawmakers realize that paying so much for the loss of a daughter, son, husband, brother, wife, or other relative is not currently an affordable option. Now, we have, as a projection, spoken about 22,000 uh, uh, victims. Now, just try multiplying that uh, quarter million. Our country would not, in fact, afford it. The South Africa Mandela inherited is vast and beautiful. Almost half the population lives outside urban areas. Blacks are the majority. The income gap between them and whites is one of the largest in the world. At the end of apartheid, independent surveys showed 41% of all households as living below poverty levels, 23 million as living without electricity, and 12 million with no access to clean drinking water. A full one-third had no education at all. Mandela's government promised better housing, schools, and jobs for all South Africans. It's a promise that remains unfulfilled. We thought that INC-led government is going to 
bring us to an equal power with the whites. But instead, we are still not on equal power. The whites are still getting more richer and the black are still getting more poorer. Sidiso and a growing number of others blame Mandela's ANC party, but they hesitate to blame the famous man himself. Being oppressed for so many years, the pains we have endured are deeply rooted. And it's going to take us years to really relieve this. Because everybody now is internally bitter. And we blacks, we feel we cannot disappoint the old man, President Nelson Mandela. After his release in 1986, Sidiso returned to Sebokang Township, where he is surrounded by countless reminders of his and his neighbor's poverty. He lives with his family in this compound, but this is not the life he fought for. My experience in prison also makes me very angry, especially the ill treatment. And also when I think of my time, I think I could have been far ahead with life. So all my plans were shattered. Sidiso, his wife Soko, and their three-year-old Atlahang share what they have with a young niece who has come to stay with them. Money is always in short supply, but Soko says it is not the source of family friction. When Sizo got 50 rand, he will never hide it from me. That is why I don't. Even if he got 20 rand, even if the, his parents gave him 200 rand, he will never hide it. He will bring it home and say, they gave me this, and we share it. <laughs> They live in tight quarters. The bathroom is located down the hall. It's a communal one, shared with other residents. Sidiso helps Soko with family duties, as does the niece, who sleeps here, under the stairwell. Soko, Sidiso, and Atlahang sleep in a room that includes the kitchen. Sidiso has now completed the high school education he began while imprisoned on Robben Island. With a number of community people, he founded this school for disabled children where he works part time. The part-time job that he's doing now, they give him a check maybe after three months. I don't know why. As he's working with the disabled people, who might used to tell him that, leave these people and try and get some other, the better job. But teaching these children is an extension of his political activism and his commitment to the community. So he stays. At the same time, he recognizes that without economic empowerment, nothing will change in the new South Africa. Today, everybody's allowed to do as he pleases. I'm allowed to go to wherever or enter in whatever hotel I wish to. But would I be in a position to go to that hotel if I don't have money? So it is not the new South Africa. Robben Island, September 24th, 1997. Government officials, ex-prisoners and their wives arrive for an invitation-only celebration of the reopening of the prison as a museum. Former prisoner Tokyo Sewali is a top government official. With him is his wife, the former Judy Moon. The two met on the island when Judy, then a paralegal, came to help prisoners with a variety of legal problems. This is it.
Special guest, President Nelson Mandela, declared the prison an international symbol of reconciliation between the races. It is a great joy for me that we can all come as free South Africans with our friends to Robben Island and even more that we are gathered to celebrate our joint heritage, nation. To acknowledge this heritage in the context of our commitment to democracy, tolerance, and human rights. That today's unity is a triumph over yesterday's division and conflict. The grand story of Robben Island is actually the transformation of this jail from the sword that mess Former up prisoner Lionel Davis is now an official museum tour guide. Many political prisoners up to their necks in sand, and the waters would urinate on their heads. On your right hand side, you'll see the visitor center. The so is this woman, Avril Brandt, the former warden's wife. During the day's festivities, even Tokyo steps in as a tour guide. Oh, but by the way, this gentleman here, are you? The The last commanding officer? Head of the prison. Yeah, the last head of the prison of Robinette. The last man to jail us here. Uh, he's now a friend. He's, he's part of uh, the, the, the ministry and the department. So the, the whole essence is, is, is to show the kind of reconciliation that we have. You read a lot about... Gerhard Brandt has been appointed the museum's head of security. Gre Gregory, you see how easy it is to take a key from his hand. <laughs> During those times, we could never, ever have this key. But all the time, without them knowing, we we're planning to have these keys. You can go inside and see where the great man used to stay. Some ex-prisoners were not invited to the celebration. Sidiso Pofu is one of them. He is sure that his politics are one reason. After the election, I had this in mind. This is our government. Let us give them time. Maybe those comrades who are in the parliament, they will rethink and reconsider that they were not alone in the struggle. They were their comrades. So they may think of devising some other means for our survival. But nothing has happened. They've even forgotten about us. But from the other end of the economic scale, the view is quite different. We need a large pizza. Yeah. There's mushrooms and olives. This is Scooby-Doo. This is Batman. <laughs> Since he left Robben Island, Tokyo has been very successful. Which one is Batman? I'm not sure. Ah, oh, this is Spider Man. And I've realized political change. And I'm not stopping. I'm going for economic change. It's, it's very tough to go into the, into the world of business, to start something new. But I'm starting it, and I want to tell you it's going to succeed. Tokyo was elected premier of Houting, South Africa's richest province, shortly after Mandela became president. He's no longer in politics, but his experience in government has made him fully aware of the dangers posed by a growing gap between the rich and poor. The more of the people who rise against Mandela and say, fine, you've got political power, you've got parliaments, you've got everything, uh, but our life is not changing, and whites are still in control. Be ready, Gabriela. Here we go. Tokyo, his wife Judy, and their two children live in a large, comfortable home in a predominantly white neighborhood. He takes his children to private schools in a chauffeur-driven car. He knows he's an exception, but is sure that eventually the rest of the nation will catch up. You see, people are not looking for big things, big houses like I have, that type of thing, uh, because my income bracket is a bit higher. People are looking for simple things. I must get captains for my house, there must be a job, there must be that, there must be schooling for my children. Those are the things they are seeing happening.
But the changes Tokyo sees are not happening fast enough for others, like Sediso. He walks his daughter through the township to her nursery school, a one-room class in a neighbor's home. Sediso knows that although he cannot give Atlahang material things, he has already bequeathed her something he did not have. A childhood free of the terrible violence that plagued his own. Sediso now wonders when children here will see the better life he and others paid so dearly for. Thank you.